So we're about to get started, everyone, but I want to encourage everyone to use or check out the QR code on there. We have, um, it's linked to operation prevention, and it's a bunch of really great resources for our parents. So please take a photo. You guys are more than welcome to check out those resources later. Just a lot of really helpful information. So we'll get started just in a few. So we're hitting 6 p.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone. My name is Maritza Gayaga, and I'm the Interim Chief of Public Affairs and Communications for Round Rock ISD. And I'd like to welcome you all to our in-person fentanyl information session. And just thank you all for being here, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to learn more about this important subject in our community. In February, we held a virtual session about the, about the topic, and for the district, it was a record-breaking session for us. We had the most attendees we ever had, and the overwhelming response told us that this was an important conversation that we needed to continue. Um, we're all here because we care about our students. We're all here because we want them to be safe, and if we're here sharing this information, if we're able to help or save the life of one student, it is absolutely worth it. Before I begin, I want to thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules as well to share their expertise and their knowledge with us tonight. I'd also like to take a moment to give a very special shout out to Betty Jo Byrne and the entire PAC Performing Arts Center crew for being our host tonight. So round of applause for them. And, and a very big special thanks to McNeil High School, the MAV Theater Tech Program, and to Aaron Johnson, the head theater teacher. They designed, they put together, they set up this amazing set for our event tonight. So a big round of applause for them for doing that as well. So with that, let's get into what tonight will look like. To start, each of our panelists will share some information about them, their organization, and how they support fentanyl awareness and prevention in our community, and, and really any information that would be helpful for our community to know. From there, we'll go ahead and take questions that we collected from audience members and questions that were previously submitted on Round Rock, our, our webpage, roundrockic.org. After our onstage Q&A, we invite our panelists and attendees to continue the conversation um, in the lobby to where you guys can talk one-on-one -on -one and maybe answer any questions that you might have been too scared to ask or some questions that may pop up during today's discussion. Um, and finally, if you still have questions after today, please contact us by using Let's Talk. It's a feature available on Round Rock ISD's website, roundrockisd.org, and we'll get to your question as soon as we can and connect you with the right person. Now let's get started. Panelists, I'm going to call you one by one, and when I call your name, please introduce yourself and share a little bit of information about you and your organization and how you support fentanyl awareness and prevention. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and our first panelist to introduce is Travis County Sheriff Sally Hernandez. Good evening. My name is Sally Hernandez. I'm the Travis County Sheriff, and I'm certainly glad to be here tonight. You know, I hear the question all the time, is fentanyl on the increase? And I'm here to tell you that in 2021, Travis County saw a 237% increase in the number of deaths caused by fentanyl. The number of fentanyl deaths in our jurisdiction has increased so dramatically that we can't hardly even go through a shift without having at least one call related to fentanyl. In the death cases we've worked involving teenagers, they all, they're all involve kids who were confident that they were taking Xanax or Adderall or Percocet. It's important to note that the fake drugs, they look just like a prescription drug. It's really almost impossible to differentiate between the two. Teens trust the person they're buying from and they think that the pill they bought came from a parent's medicine cabinet when in reality it's nothing but fentanyl. And I want to make it clear that these are really great kids who are falling victims to fentanyl. A student who is stressed out, and they're gonna take a test the next day, they buy a 
uh, Xanax from a friend. They take it, they go to bed, and they don't wake up. That's why the slogan, one pill can kill, is, is being used. If you're selling pills at school, you may not know that what you're selling is fentanyl. Uh, but if you are selling, uh, or if you are selling fake prescription pills, they almost all certainly are fentanyl, in, or at least have fentanyl in them. You might not sell someone a pill that kills them, but it will definitely cause addiction and destruction. But I want you to hear me on this. If you sell someone a pill and that person dies from the fentanyl in that pill, you could face very serious charges that would end your life in prison. What we're talking about tonight has serious implications uh, for everyone involved. I've been in law enforcement for over 40 years. This is a very, very important topic, and I can't thank Round Rock ISD. Um, I, I want to thank you so much for having this conversation and bringing uh, awareness to parents, to students, and to our community. Thank you, Sheriff. Our next panelist is Stacy Jones, a representative from Life Steps Council. Hello, folks. How are you doing this evening? My name is Stacy Jones. I'm with uh, the executive director of um, Life Steps Council on Alcohol and Drugs. Um, we're a um, facility that um, actually provides education and awareness um, for substance use or misuse, um, as well as uh, providing additional assistance for individuals um, that may be challenged with those particular areas um, with children um, and our parents that are learning uh, to parent um, without the use of substance. And then one of the other things that we do, which I think is probably one of our, our mainstays, is our coalition, and that is working in the community and community engagement dealing with prevention. As far as um, the reason why I'm here um, is to talk to you in a very frank manner, um, not just from the experience aspect of being a therapist and working in, uh, in the facilities, um, at treatment centers, etc., but also to talk to you about um, what it's like for those individuals that go through this, um, especially working in the prison systems, which I have uh, for quite a few t for quite a few years. Um, I've had an opportunity to have conversations that are unlike what many would have, and uh, I like to bring those insights to conversations like this. And I, I like to also focus on the fact that the need for a courageous conversation that sometimes um, we're afraid to have. And hopefully today, uh, we'll have an opportunity to expound upon that a little bit. But again, thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Next, our next panelist is Becky Stewart. She's a local activist and the founder of A Change for Cam. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, um, those of you in person and online, and thank you for having me as a panelist. My name is Becky Stewart, and I founded A Change for CAM, and um, unfortunately, it was for some very um, tragic reasons. On March 20th of 2021, I lost my 19-year-old son, Cameron, to fentanyl poisoning. Um, you know, Cameron was one of those kids that Sheriff Hernandez just talked about. Um, he was a good kid. He was... Um, a great student, a great athlete, state champion hurdler, funny kid, gregarious, um, your everyday all-American kid. And, um, you know, our lives were forever changed on March 20th, two years ago. And shortly after Cameron died, well, Cameron made an incredibly poor choice to buy a pill off of Snapchat. And that one pill that he thought he was getting to calm his nerves contained a lethal dose of fentanyl. And, um, you know, he did have mental health issues. He had depression, anxiety, but from the outside looking in, you would have never known that kid was sad a day in his life or that he struggled a day in his life. He, he kept that mask on and, um, you know, instead of dealing and coping in really healthy ways to feel better for a long time, he chose to go down the path of, of experimenting with substances, and that spiraled out of control for a while. We got him help, and then he was doing better, probably still had some anxiety, so we wanted to get a Valium off of Snapchat. 
And that Valium contained a lethal dose of fentanyl. And um, that's why I'm here, unfortunately. But um, shortly after he died, I realized that urgency to get the word out of the dangers of fentanyl. And I, I have a voice. I can use my voice. I'm comfortable speaking, especially on a topic that I know is so important. And I just couldn't stand the, the thought of not doing anything and having other families continue to go through the tragedy that my family's gone through. So um, it's created solely to educate students, parents, and communities on the danger that's out there. And I've been doing that for a little over a year and a half now. And um, I'm a member of a club that nobody wants to be in. And that is growing way too quickly. Um, I love each and every one of the, the parents I come across that are in our grieving family groups and the ones that are doing advocacy as well. But truly, I wish I'd never met any of them. That would mean our kids would be here. So I'm here just to hopefully answer questions or provide some insight that might be helpful to somebody to take away with. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing, Becky. Next, we have Daniel Sledge. He is a paramedic with the Round Rock Fire Department. Test. Hi, I'm Daniel Sledge. I'm the lead outreach medic with the Round Rock Fire Department Crisis Response Unit. Um, we are a, an emergency service and we are dispatched through the 911 system to behavioral health crises in the field. Uh, we co-respond with law enforcement, fire department, EMS, um, and try and engage, um, engage folks in care uh, from the scene and get EMS and, and those other resources back in service. Uh, we do pre-arrest jail diversions, emergency department diversions. Um, we also do uh, naloxone distribution and public education on recognizing and responding to overdose. Um, and we do post-overdose uh, follow-ups um, where we make uh, contact with folks uh, where we're able to um, and just engage with them. We're not there to force them into anything, but rather to partner with them, um, help advocate for them, and make them aware of services they may not know that they're uh, eligible for. and. Um, just uh, collaborate so that they can be as happy and healthy as they want to be. Um, and uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Daniel. And now we're going to go to, I think he may need a, a mic passed to him. Thank you, Sheriff. Oh, he has one. It was, it was an illusion. It was, it was a little hidden. Um, so n next we have the Round Rock ISD Chief of Police, Chief Dennis Weiner. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you again for coming out tonight. This is an important conversation, and uh, we're very happy to be here to be able to hopefully answer your questions, but also um, tell a little bit about why we think this is important for all of us to, uh, to be active and proactive, actually, uh, on this issue. A lot of the students on our campuses, um, I should say a very small percentage, actually, experiment with drugs. The problem with experimenting these days is they never know what they're actually experimenting with. And so they may be innocently trying uh, what they believe to be marijuana, and it ends up being laced with fentanyl, and they have a tragic outcome. Uh, I just had a conversation not too long ago with a parent whose, uh, whose child was away at college, and very good uh, communication between the parent and, and the student. The student called uh, the mom to let her know that he was going to experiment with drugs, something he hadn't done before. And of course, now she was a, uh, very upset with with him um, wanting to do that, but in his mind, you know, he was he was communicating with his mom, articulating why he wanted to do it, and felt that um, at least at, at its core, the family was communicating. He, um, you know, at, at the age of a college student, they're adults and they're making their own decisions, um, but at least he had the respect to call home and talk with his mom about what he was intending to do so that she wouldn't be surprised at a tragic outcome. Um, and she felt powerless because she was separated by, by hours and hours of travel. Um, but the, the, these, are, these are the situations we're dealing with today. And really, the, one of the best ways we can reach um, these students is through strong, robust co communication. And it may not always be successful, but we always have to try. And that's one of the, uh, the aspects of what our, what our officers are doing on campuses, is they're making themselves available, even if it's just to answer questions 
or uh, put students in touch with resources. And so that's why uh, we're very um, uh, passionate about making sure that our officers are prepared to help students. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Weiner. Next, we have our Director of Behavioral Services, Dr. Amy Grosso. Hi, thank you all, all for being here. And I love seeing the variety of people here because this is not a simple issue and it's not a simple answer. And I think it is complex and it takes all of us. It takes families, it takes the community, and it does take school that we all have a part of the puzzle to help students and for them to be able to understand and for us to get them what they need. Um, in my role here at Round Rock ISD, I um, basically deal with a lot of the higher level mental health needs of our students. Um, we are part of a bigger aspect of what we do for mental health of students in Round Rock ISD. You know, that starts in elementary schools when we teach coping skills, resiliency, empathy, and then it goes into the work our counselors do. And then if students need more help after that, that's the department I have the pleasure of leading. So I oversee a team of social workers. We have 12 campus-based um, social workers and then a staff social worker. I also oversee our mental health centers, which is a partnership we have with Blue Bonnet Trails. And then also T-Chat, which is a teletherapy uh, program we partner with Dell Med School for. And how we fit into this equation, I think you heard both from the sheriff and from Becky that kids who are struggling and seek out even buying a Xanax off the street, they're dealing with something going on underneath, right? It's not just one day they decide to do that. Is it underlying stress, anxiety, depression? Is it past trauma that hasn't been, um, had the opportunity to be addressed? And so for us, if we can provide services for students, especially around mental health and get them the help they need before they need to start self-medicating, the, that that's where we really see the work we do. Um, our social workers also really work with students and families that if a student is struggling with an addiction, um, that to be able to partner with outside agencies like Life Steps or others in the community to be able to get that student the help that they need. Um, I think one of the biggest things we do also is to try to lower the stigma around mental health. And so students and parents, let me just say this, parent, if your student is struggling with mental health or an addiction, it's not your fault. And it doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong in the same way as if your student struggled with something with their physical health. And so that's a lot of the work that I get the pleasure of doing every day. Thank you, Dr. Grosso. Next, we have our Director of Health Services, Brandy Hafner. Good evening. My name is Brandy Hafner. I'm the Director of Health Services with Round Rock ISD. Um, I have been involved in the process of um, educating the health services staff. Daniel and his team helped um, train the school nurses uh, over a year ago. So we have had the training and the Narcan um, on our campuses for over a year. Uh, we feel prepared as far as uh, the health services and the um, and the police department is also has access to Narcan. The other group that has uh, Narcan right now are the athletic trainers. So right now we have school nurses, athletic trainers, and police officers. We are working with Daniel and his team, some other community partners to expand that. Uh, we would like to increase access to the community as far as having that available in every one of our school buildings. And those will be placed in the uh, AED box. The AED is where we keep the uh, defibrillator that we would use if there was a cardiac emergency. Um, so Daniel has a little bag that's to his left down there on the floor. I'm sure he can hold it up. But this is, um, attached to, to the AE, or it's going to be attached. We are working on the deployment right now. Uh, but that bag has information about what to do um, if there was an emergency, and it has the actual Narcan inside there. So while we are working to place those in all of the AED boxes in our district, um, along with that goes training. So what, what I mentioned earlier was the three groups that currently have the training, and we need to increase that to the other members of our school staff. So we are working with our, um, with our campus uh, administrators to deliver that to our teams um, at the beginning of the school year when we have back to school um, continuing education type events. So um, our 
the rest of our staff will be trained um, in August and September when they go through those type trainings. It is, um, it's not a difficult thing to administer, but we want people to know what they're looking for. We want anybody, not just the nurse, not just the police officer, and not just the health, uh, or not just the athletic trainers, to be able to respond to these emergencies, because they could occur anywhere around the school. They could occur in the afternoon after um, our staff is gone. We just want to increase the access, so it is there, um, since this is really a community-wide response. We really want to be able, a good part of that. Thank you, Brandy. Next, we have our Round Rock ISD Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Hafed Azaiz. Well, good evening, and thank you for being here. Um, like Brandy was talking, obviously, we have to be prepared. Uh, unfortunately, things happen, worst case scenario. But really, what we are trying to do here in our district is really to be as much as possible and proactive. Um, so. Part of being proactive is educating our, our parents, our community, our, our students, uh, training our staff, and things like that. So our job is really to ensure, again, that to avoid at any, any cost having a, a students who are actually overdosing uh, because of fentanyl or any other drug, really. But we need to be prepared for that as well, right? But really, the more we can do up front, um, and as, again, educating and communicating and working together, because it really takes a village. So we have to work together as a community, as parents. Um, I'm so happy to see you know, uh, our partners here with us come in to educate us some more and explain to us what else we can do to help us keep our students safe in our schools and also at home. So again, very grateful uh, for, for everyone really coming together, but it will take all of us working together to help our students and keep them safe. Thank you for being here again. I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing that information. And, and now we're going to go ahead and get to the question and, question and answer portion of the evening. We asked or we had some questions or some questions that audience members submitted before the event. We also had some that they submitted online. And so our first question is, it's, it's simple. I mean, I think, I think we may have addressed it, but I think maybe we need to go over it again. It's, are children really seeking, are, are they really seeking fentanyl? <laughs> I'm no expert, but um, in, in the advocacy work that I've been doing, um, obviously you heard Cam's story, he was not seeking fentanyl, but if there are those out there who have been exposed to fentanyl and didn't actually die from it, it can create pretty much an instant addiction and they do start searching for it. So some are seeking it, um, the majority are not, but um, it is so highly addictive that if you are lucky enough to live through it, you will start having those cravings. From, from a standpoint of um, individuals looking to, um, to use a substance, Dr. Grusso used the example that, um, and, and I love that example, and that is that it, it's something that's underlying and therefore, I look for something um, like a substance to uh, provide relief. For me, it's Round Rock Donuts, right? And, and I say that jokingly, but I'm very serious about that. And if, if what I ingest, it gives me the relief that I'm looking for, then that becomes my thing. Uh, Miss Becky had just said something that was also pretty powerful, and that is, once I try something and it works, then I will probably try that again, right, and see that it works. For individuals that I have had in a couple of my treatment facilities that I worked at, I've had a few that actually actively sought um, out sought out fentanyl because they have um, developed a particular tolerance um, for that type of a high that they they like to ingest. If you're familiar with the news, um, or at least looking at the news now, you'll see that um, especially, it actually has come here to the, our area, but it's especially known um, in the East Coast that individuals need a kick for fentanyl. Now you might be saying, well, wh why would you want a kick for fentanyl when fentanyl is 10,000 times stronger than even heroin? We're looking at, um, they're using xylazine or trank. Um, which is added to the uh, fentanyl just to get another high, right? So uh, it, it's, it, it's one of those things where it, can you say that a person is actively seeking it? I'm going to go back to I'm seeking the high that does what I need it to do. 
and how fast I can get there is what I have seen and the experience for the individuals I have worked with. Thanks. Thank you. And our next question just kind of goes off that, and I think, again, we touched base on this at the beginning, but just to kind of more go a little bit more in depth, um, how often are we seeing fentanyl over overdoses or uh, in our community? Well, I can start the conversation. So I can say just from the perspective of the school district, thankfully, we haven't had any um, overdoses on campus. And so, um, but we don't take comfort in that it just hasn't happened yet. We're always assuming that it's out there. I, as a matter of fact, we have recovered some fentanyl on a campus. Um, it was unassociated with any individual student. However, um, that indicates to us that it's, it's there, it's in, it's in the community, and we have to be cognizant of that. Um, but I think I'll turn it over maybe to Round Rock of, uh, Fire Department as to what they're seeing in the greater community. Yeah, we're seeing, um, we talk to the, the folks that are on the truck, the, the, the fire apparatus or the ambulance, and there's almost every shift they're running, um, at least an overdose, um, just in, in our area. Um, and it's, it's not surprising, you know, these, the fentanyl in the form of pressed pills has been around for a while, um, for a handful of years in our area, um, but it's just grown exponentially kind of since, um, probably since the start of lockdown. Um, and then it's just, it's not gone, gone away. Um, so in terms of the, the question about our, our people seeking fentanyl, I would say there's, there's two groups. Number one is there's a group of, of folks who are seeking out prescription pain medicines or prescription anti-anxiety medicines, and they are getting what looks like those tablets, but they are pressed and they're counterfeit and they don't, they're not aware of that. Number two is going to be people who know that all of the, the, the tablets that are sold, bought and sold on the street contain fentanyl and they are dependent on fentanyl and they, they know that if I want an opioid, that's the only one I can get. So they are continuing to use. Um, so I would say it's, it, it's not like a, a yes or a no, it's, it's different in different situations. Thank you. And what is, what is the most common form of fentanyl that we're seeing? Is it, I mean, I know that we, we have some questions from our parents if it's coming in vape form or pill form. What is the most common form in which students are accessing it or, or people? I don't mind answering that. It, it clearly is in pill fo form that we're seeing the majority of the fentanyl. I'm not saying that they can't use it in vapes and those kind of things, but what we're seeing is in pill form. And I'll second that as well. The, the, what we recovered on campus was in pill form. Uh, this, uh, one of the questions, and I'll go ahead and move it up, is that our parents are hearing that it, it's not only, it looks like candy, I know we're saying it's in pills, but that it looks like candy, it could be in gummy form, but if somebody potentially took fentanyl, would it taste sweet like candy? Fentanyl is going to taste like anything that it's mixed with, right? So if they mix it with sugar, it's going to taste sweet. If they mix, you know, right? Yeah. The, I've, I've not heard of um, a lot of um, cases of, or any cases of gummies that, that had fentanyl. I know that there was a lot of talk about rainbow fentanyl just prior to Halloween. Um, that didn't actually end up happening, thank goodness. Um, but in, in terms of the question about what's the most common form uh, that we see the fentanyl in, I can tell you right now, it's going to be uh, blue press tablets that look like oxycodone 30 milligram tablets. Um, they've got an M with square around it on one side. The other side is scored and has a 30 on it. Um, by far the most common form. Can I just add something? I think that there's a lot of parents that are afraid that if it does look like candy, somebody's going to take it. I, I, the people who sell this, they're selling it for profit. So it's not gonna be dropped in trick or treat bags or any of those things. I mean, they're, they're doing, they're selling these pills for profit. You know, if we can kind of add to this conversation 
And that is that, um, does a person even know, right? And how, how, how important that is. Many of us probably go to a cafe, right? I remember being a server at some point in time. And, and if I'm walking back quickly and I got things to do and you're like, hey, can I get a refill on my coffee? I'm like, yeah, sure. Is that decaf? Well, wait a minute. In my mind, I'm trying to get you your coffee, but I'm trying to get back to the back. So I might say, yeah, it's decaf, <laughs> and I'm giving you straight caffeine. That might happen to any of us, right? And we don't know that. And the reason why I use that as an analogy that if someone does perhaps want to get a little cocaine or maybe they do, they're looking for some ecstasy because they want to get the party going, their knowledge of whether any of those substances might contain fentanyl is none, right. little to none, unless, like, like Daniel had mentioned, right, they are actively seeking it. So I think that that's really an important thing to remember, that there is a Russian roulette aspect to all of this. I might add a little bit to what Daniel said as well. I'm, I'm not sure... Um, the Percocet um, demand will ever be overtaken, but these guys that are making these fake pills know what we are short of here in America and what we demand here in, here in America. So it's supply, I, I'm assuming if, if it's coming from across the border, but they are making them here in our own backyards as well. But um, they know the supply and demand issues, and they know what we're short of. Right now, uh, we have a shortage of Adderall. And so what do you think they're going to do with that? They're going to start cranking up their supply of fake Adderall because people who take Adderall or have taken legitimate prescription Adderall know what it looks like. So if they, they purchase Adderall and don't go through the proper channels, they're going to say, oh, that's a legitimate pill. That looks exactly what I've taken before, not knowing it's a fake pill. So, um, yes, there are top pills that are being demanded, but there, there is also this ebb and flow of what we have a shortage of, and they know it almost instantly, so they're cranking that supply up just for that to meet that demand. Thank you. And how, how does someone know if something, I, I know you're, we talked about it's a Russian roulette, like you really don't know, but the question is, is, how, is there a way that someone can find out if there's fentanyl in something? Dan, well, Daniel needs to take this one because he knows what's... There, there is a way, <laughs> but well, I don't know how assume much... Assume can... everything that didn't come from a pharmacy is fake right. because there's right. almost right. no legitimate prescription pills on the black market nowadays. Until... Um, fentanyl strips are legalized um, so the individuals can, um, can test the substance before ingesting it. Um, that would be one of the ways, but I love that what Becky said and, and what Daniel said, and I definitely want him to jump in there, because again, you don't know. And how can you really tell? You know? I, I mean, honestly, Think about how you do your ranch dressing. Do you know if you like it, you stip your finger in it, you taste it a little bit, right? And you might like it or you might not. And you don't really get that opportunity when it comes to the substances that a person might be ingesting. It doesn't work the same way. Yeah, the, the fennel testing strips is, and I know the, the ledge is in session, so it's a, a, a hot topic right now. But... Um, they are uh, used as harm reduction tools in, in uh, a lot of places, um, and they give information. Um, number one, it's a tool of engagement. So if we talk to somebody who is using what they report to only be stimulants, we can say, hey, th this is not just found uh, in what's sold as heroin or pain pills. You need to be on the lookout for this uh, no matter what you're using. Um, and so then just engaging folks, um, there were some research papers that showed that uh, fentanyl testing strips actually changed the behavior of a drug use episode so that somebody either used less, used slower, um, had somebody else present uh, during the use. So ways to just reduce 
risk around that use. It's giving information. They're not foolproof. Um, there can be false positives sometimes in some cases. There can also be, uh, it, some of the test strips may not be sensitive for every analog that's out there. Um, but again, it's information. It would be, it's information on an unregulated substance. So if we went back to prohibition and we had methanol test strips, you know, things that could test for the presence of, you know, these neurotoxins, these poisons that are um, from the byproducts of making illicit alcohol, you know, people would use that. Some people might drink it all still anyway. Some people might drink less. Some people might drink it not at all. So it's just, it's, it's information. I just want to make sure everybody understood too that currently testing strips are considered drug paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. So you can't, we can't have them. Officers can have testing strips. And so that's part of the problem too. I know we got some questions like, why aren't, why is the district not giving out testing strips? Well, we would then be distributing, which would be a crime. And so I think that's important things to know about here in Texas and the Texas laws. Um, there is a bill in legislation right now to try to change that because of everything, but that's where we are currently and what we have to work with. And nothing stops you from contacting your state representatives and Senate to talk to them about the importance of testing strips either. So as a, you know, parent, as a part of the community, the more calls that you make, uh, the better it is. Yeah, that's great to know. I mean, even our next question was, how can I buy fentanyl strips? And now we know you can't. So <clears throat> please, if you would like to just contact, contact your representatives, these are the people who make the decisions and it's an important decision and it's important for people to have knowledge. Um, so our next question really, it goes back to usage and, and where we're seeing it, it come from. Like what, at what grade level or what age of, of student, of what age of child is it happening? Is it middle school, is it high school? I mean that's, we, I, we, have a, we had a few middle school parents concerned that it starts young. So is there an age to where we're typically seeing it or is there, is, I mean we kind of don't know or do, do we have any idea? So at the district level, I know um, we are not typically seeing it yet. And, and the one instance where we recovered some fentanyl was on a high school campus. So I'm not suggesting there isn't any on middle schools. Um, what I think the, the conversation we need to have with the children is know who you're taking things from. And if it's, if it's a stranger or a f even a friend, if it's not a trusted adult, doctor, parent, they shouldn't be taking any uh, from anyone. Because even if that other person didn't intend to harm them, th the effect may be that they harmed them. So I think it's important that we have that conversation as well. And I'd like to add, um, considering fentanyl is the number one killer of Americans ages 14, or excuse me, 18 to 45, um, I would beg to differ on that and say that it's a lot younger than that because tracking for it right now, um, deaths related to fentanyl is really poor. And a lot of them aren't tested at all as far as the deaths, um, no toxicology's done. So had those been tested on the younger um, subjects, I, who knows, you know, it could be fentanyl related, but we're seeing them younger and younger. I have parents in my group who've lost a 13-year-old. And so to me, it's, it's never too young to start educating and having those conversations with your kids. Age appropriate, obviously, um, but start them at a young age and knowing what, what you want to say to your kids, what message you want to get across, and to carry that through to a healthy adult life. I'm just going to add that I know that there was an article out of Dallas that there were fentanyl deaths in the middle school. Uh, the parents that I've spoken to, most of them have had, their, their kids were in high school. So, I mean, it's all over, just like, you know, in, just like she, Becky said, there, it gets younger and younger, especially the more and more fentanyl that we get in our community. Uh, so. And 
I agree about talking to your kids about fentanyl and having a discussion, and I don't know if, if I can move into that area, it, but the kind of discussion that you have is so vital. When you try to uh, talk to them about drugs and, and it comes across like you're interrogating or you're judging them, you're not gonna have enough, you're not gonna be as effective. If you start talking to them about uh, the scientific stuff about fentanyl, about what to do in case of emergencies and deaths that are being, you know, that are happening in the community, I mean, that is really effective. And I know from personal experience, when I was a investigator at the DA's office, we worked a lot of intoxication manslaughter cases. And I would go home and I'd talk to my son about those intoxication manslaughter cases. And he would say, mom, you know, it's only beer. I only had a beer or, I mean, but they can see the effect of, of, of what's happening. And, uh, and it's not so much the interrogation. It's more the let's talk about this and uh, let's talk about it scientifically. Let's talk about what you do. And you know, if a friend, if something happens to a friend, it's really making the discussion come alive. I want to add to that too that, you know, I, I don't think you don't wait to start having that conversation. I'm even thinking when we did the virtual forum, and I have a nine year old, so after I went upstairs, he was already going to bed, and he's like, What was your work meeting about? And so I started explaining, and I was like, It was about fentanyl crisis. And he's like, What's that? And so then we had a, a good discussion, just like it's a drug that's being used, and, you know, it's why we don't take anything that's not from mom or dad or a doctor. You know, that's all it had to be. I will say it's important to have the conversation as the sheriff is talking about, like, about what it is and the scientific and that people die. I also think it's critical that we from a young age have a conversation with our, our kids about mental health. It's critical from a young age we talk about emotions and feelings and it's okay if we don't feel okay, that we're not going to feel great every day, and that we as parents are a safe person for them to come to, and we're there to listen, not judge, so that if our students are struggling with something, they feel like they can come to us. If they're feeling overwhelmed or stressed out, or they don't think they can take any more, that instead of trying to self-medicate to get through that, that we are a safe person for them to come to. And that's not a one-time conversation. It's an everyday conversation. I always ask parents, do you ask about emotions and feelings as much as you ask about grades? Do you ask about emotions and feelings as much as you ask about grades? I have to catch myself on this one too, and I talk about it all the time. If we as adults don't talk about it and we don't op open the door to it, our kids will never talk to us about these things because they won't think it's okay to talk about. And so just the more we talk about it, the more it's an ongoing conversation, then it becomes a safe conversation to have. I just want to add uh, <clears throat> that uh, from uh, our district uh, perspective, we started last fall doing um, um, a fentanyl awareness campaign uh, at the high school levels. Uh, we did not do one um, at middle and elementary, obviously, but we are, do, we are having, we are doing a campaign started that last semester you know, with our high school students, but like Dr. Grosso and the rest were saying, obviously, it's, it's really a parent choice, and um, we hope that you're having some type of conversation about how we stay away from all these drugs and, and uh, the safety risks that that poses for all of them. So again, it's gonna take all of us working together to making sure that, again, keeping our students safe, but we are doing uh, a campaign already in our high schools. There's an, there's, a, there's an incredible underlying message that can sometimes be overlooked. And Dr. Grusso hit it, right? And, and, and Becky actually hit it before. Actually, everybody has hit it. And that is, if I'm looking to change the way I feel, I'm not looking to die. I'm just looking to change the way I feel. Think about that for a second. Very seldom does anybody pull out a substance that they're about to ingest and say, 
okay, this is it. I'm checking out. I'll see you in a little bit. I'm taking this substance and I'm gone. Usually there's an underlying factor. And what that underlying factor is, we don't know. And just as Ed mentioned, having these courageous conversations, keeping that dialogue open, giving individuals choices, and if not you, someone else that they can speak with. When I was a child, I loved pressing red buttons. And if you told me that it was going to burn me, I'd press it anyway. Right? And not only would I press it once, I might press it two or three or four times, right? Because all of a sudden, it didn't burn that bad. I want you to think about that for a second. When we tar start talking about why individuals use any substance, it usually starts out in experimentation. What happens after that is an invisible, divisible line that they themselves don't even know or they're aware of. And that's really important. But if we go back to the antecedent, and you guys have all hit that so eloquently, it goes back to addressing the why. There's always a why. And I just wanted to add to that, too. Um, it's pretty much already been said, but to normalize how they're feeling. Um, you know, Cameron was really embarrassed that he struggled. He was really embarrassed that he had depression and anxiety, and he didn't want any of his friends to know. And, and he wouldn't really open up to us about it because of that embarrassment um, and the shame that he felt went along with that. And how I wish when he was younger I would have known to have that conversation in a really dang, Cameron, I used to feel like that all the time when I was your age, and, and normalize it and just talk about, not just ask him about his feelings, but I wish I would have talked to him about his feelings and really, well, how did that make you feel? Or well, what did you do then? Or how, do you, uh, how could you have changed how, how that outcome was? And gave him the ability to start thinking through those problems on his own instead of, Oh, shake it off, you'll be better tomorrow. I, I didn't say that. But, I mean, that's what happens a lot of times these days is it's just sloughed off of, oh, you're just stressed out today. But, you know, when we were younger, I'm sure all of us felt the same way a lot of our kids are feeling today. And relate that, you know. Relay that to them and say, hey, you know, when I was five, I remember feeling this way. Or when I was 10, I remember this. Or I had this situation come up with a friend, and that really made me mad, and I didn't know how to talk to that friend. Or So those normal conversations on a daily basis are what's going to get your kids really comfortable in, in coming to you and not waiting for you to approach them. And obviously, it's already been said, but um, you know, I, I, I know I got Cameron the help he needed so I don't have regrets there, but I do have regrets of conversations that I wish I would have had. That's all. And I will say for us who are of an older generation, we didn't grow up talking about these things, right? We didn't, all about drugs were just don't do it. And then anything with mental health is, well, you don't talk about that, right? There was such a stigma. And if you struggled, it's because you were weak and you weren't strong enough and there was something is completely wrong with you. Students now don't view mental health that way. They want to talk about it. They understand it so much better than we do. And so it's okay if you're struggling, like, how do I even talk about this? Like, just even understanding that they're willing to talk and they want to. Even pre-pandemic, um, yes, mental health was a concern for our students even before the pandemic. I would get, talk to some students and I remember asking them, like, what, what is one thing we as the adults can do? And they said, can you please just help my parents understand that I really am going through this. I'm not just being dramatic. I'm not just wanting attention, but this really is hard, or I really am stressed out, or life is completely different than when they grew up. And so I think that's something for us all to remember is that more than anything, we don't have to have the, an the answers. We just need to be willing to listen and engage in it. 
So you guys bring up such valuable points about continually having these conversations really about really difficult topics, mental health and fentanyl. But for parents who are struggling to even begin those conversations, is there any advice, is there any tips that you can provide for them to give them a starting point to where they can build that to make it a continual conversation? I will say if you're hearing this question, you're clearly watching or here present, even just saying, hey, I went to this session today on fentanyl and I'm just curious what you think. Like, what do you know about it? Just engaging in that and realizing you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the scientific knowledge about it, but just willing to say, we can learn about it together. Or are you hearing about it with, from your friends? Do your friends know about it? I think that's a great starting point and you can totally use that you were here or listen to this as that starting point is the way to open the door for the conversation. Um, also to know that maybe they're not gonna engage that first time, but the way in which you approach it, are you open, leaving the door open or are you slamming it shut? <laughs> so do we leave it open so that we can keep continuing to have it or they feel safe coming back? I would just like to add that, that uh, when you start having these conversations and you say a little bit and then you decide I'm just going to leave it because they're not wanting necessarily to talk to me, don't discount the seed that you planted. Because as you plant that seed, you're saying I care, I, I want to have a conversation about this. Uh, so you just got to start. I often use the phrase intellectual curiosity. And I, I believe it starts with that, especially as a parent, a guardian. Um, there is a certain amount of inquisitive thought that I think is necessary for you to have. I'm not telling you to go out and try it, by no means do I condone that. However, there is a lot of information that's out there. There's a lot of verbiage that's out there. Getting and having an understanding of that verbiage, I used in the last um, meeting that we were together, I said something about uh, blue dolphins with uh, triple stack blue dolphins with chocolate chips. And what does that sound like? And for you, you might go, whoa, wait a minute, is that like Chips Ahoy or something where that actually is ecstasy with heroin in it. Just having that knowledge of understanding some of the verbiage, some of the words that are used out there um, is important. Um, as Dr. Russo also said that, you know, a lot of us, we grew up in an era where you didn't talk about these things. And I will tell you, it's interesting in, in the prison systems that in talking to someone about their mental health, that's taboo but they can have a drug problem all day long and they'll accept that. Because with a mental health challenge or concern that makes me a target or I'm weak. It's beautiful that younger people today are willing to at least address those areas of, of concern. The parents also have to be comfortable with addressing those areas of concern as well as being able to recognize that even you yourself, you might be dealing with something, right? So the conversation becomes, it's reciprocal and it has to be open. Are there any resources or anyone that uh, parents can reach out to at the campus or community level to get more information or to help kind of guide those conversations or, or just to help support their student or support their child? Yeah, there's many different resources that we have as a district. Um, your, your child school counselor is a great place to start, um, that they're a wealth of information. We also, um, Behavioral Health Services, uh, we have a website, behavioralhealth.roundrockisd.org, that has great resources on a variety of different mental health topics, from crisis situations just to every day, parent support, their student support. So there's a section even for you as the parent or guardian of what you need. So there is good information out there. I will say if you just Google like mental health and teens, you're gonna be way overwhelmed. So just starting somewhere where you have those. Also recognizing that if your child's struggling, 
and you do need a, a different level of support, such as an outside therapist or something, that's okay. And it doesn't mean you failed as a parent. Um, and that that actually can be a really wonderful process and the therapist works with the child, but also with the whole family un unit and can help open some of those conversations. Um, so all, like I said, on our website, there's tons of resources for families to give that starting point, but your child school counselor is always, always a great resource. Also on the police department website on the fentanyl page, um, we're putting a link there to the DEA resources that are available, and um, they're significant in terms of there's toolkits for parents, toolkits for students. So a lot of the um, a lot of those resources that can that you can draw on at home are available, and I think that's uh, that's an important starting point. I think it was you, Chief, when you talked about the uh, one pill one kill, right? Who brought up the one pill one kill? That was you, right? The last discussion, there is actually, uh, through the DEA website, a great um, uh, YouTube uh, videos and, and so forth. If you go out to the One Pill, One Kill, or One Pill Can Kill, um, just Google it, and uh, you'll actually be, have an opportunity to, to watch some of just amazing, uh, informative videos. We're currently doing a, a series of videos where we're interviewing moms like Becky who uh, tell their story, and it's a great resource, and they're in production right now, but they should be on our website, and we're gonna be sharing them with uh, the school districts uh, soon. And speaking of DEA, I have some resources on the table back there, um, just some flyers from DEA, and I forget who is mentioning um, the um, lingo that some of these dealers and sellers are using but they there are emojis out there drug emojis and there's a one of the flyers back there is called drug emojis decoded and it may sound ridiculous but they are carrying on conversations without even typing a word every everything that they're putting out there are emojis and it, it indicates what they have how much they have the strength of it where they're going to be and so it's really good to stay up to date on the latest that's out there and it's ever changing. So feel free to grab any of those resources. But um, you know, as Stacy said, the DEA has an amazing website. There's also an incredible um, video. Um, if you Google or um, go to naturalhigh.org, there's a video there that it's like a six minute video, it's real short, but it's very, very impactful. Really um, some good information in there from kind of start to finish of this whole cycle. I know we've talked a lot about, like, the, the, the big conversation is mental health. Like, we've had a big conversation about that. And I know we talk about how to support students, but what signs should parents be looking for? Um, are there signs to where they can see if their child is in emotional distress? Is there anything that they can look for? I would say you know your child better than anybody, probably. And any change in their emotions, their behavior, even the way they're talking, I think sometimes we like to just sort of push it aside and say teens are moody or, oh my gosh, they're just going through a phase. And that might be, right? I remember I was probably pretty moody as a teen, but I also struggled with a lot of anxiety that wasn't known. Um, and so I think being willing to have a conversation and honest, um, to take the time and just say, hey, I've noticed, you know, you seem a little down, you know, being willing to just engage in that. Um, like I said, too often I think we, don't give credit enough to the little signs we see along the way. We think, oh, if I don't pay attention to it, like it'll just get better on itself. Um, we never do that with physical health, right? If your kid had a like 101 fever, I don't think we'd be like, eh, they're fine. We don't need to do anything. Um, but we do that with mental health a lot that we think, oh, they'll just snap out of it. Um, and that's not true that we need to provide that support and sometimes get outside assistance. So I think just paying attention, you already recognize it, but just being willing to talk about it. Thank you, Amy. And so Becky brought up a, a very a very good point on the lingo that, that people are using in order to get it. But I think a, an important question that we haven't touched base on is how, like how they're accessing it and, and what are the, 
Are they using apps or what are what are the routes that they that students or anyone is going to obtain fentanyl or obtain drugs that could contain fentanyl? It's all online. Like um, I would say that um, with technology, we're past uh, the point of having to drive to a certain corner or or a certain you know neighborhood or whatever you have to to go cop. You can sit in the comfort of your I don't know beanbag chair, or whatever else, make all purchases the same way we do with anything else. Whether you know we're buying. Um, you know, shoes on Amazon or whatever. You can add stuff to your cart. Um, you can do it on the surface web and you can do it on the dark web as well. Um, and we've got non-traceable currencies. There's just a whole, this is all way beyond me. And so, um, you know, but what I will say is um, a lot of, a lot of fentanyl is coming through the post um, and it's being accessed online. Social media, text messaging, I mean, we've seen where we've gotten to a home and there's a death and, and there's a text message. I mean, it's, it's any way that you can think uh, they're communicating. Yeah, and as Daniel said, you're, it's it's not going to the bad part of town looking for someone standing on the street corner selling something. These are peers selling to peers, kids selling to kids. Um, the one who sold to Cameron was 18 years old when he sold it to him. And he, he was from Leander area and went to Glen High School. And so it, it's not your, your typical um, drug field that you're used to hearing about. And the last report I heard, um, and this is probably about a year old, so I probably need to get it updated, but there are over 90,000 drug dealers on social media. Let that number sink in, 90,000 drug dealers. As Daniel said, it's just like Amazon ordering, Amazon, ordering a pizza. They deliver it to you. You could be having family night with your kids and, and your kids are on their phone ordering some type of substance and they step outside for a quick five minutes and come right back in and you know no different. So um, yeah, it's, it's dangerous out there. I think that was a awesome statement, right? That you don't know. Many of you go to Walmart, HEB, Target, and there's a deal happening right in front of you and you have no idea. Maybe you do. There's so many things I wish I didn't know anymore that when I see it, it's like I wish I could unlearn that, but I can't because I see it happening. And if we take away the bias that we have of what we think the person that sells illicit substances looks like, it's no longer what it used to be from back in the day, right? It, it, it is not. It, it's completely different. And the accessibility as you had mentioned, you know, as you had mentioned, it's it's so much easier today, and with especially with the youth being more technologically advanced than a lot of us may be, <laughs> right? Um, the being able to go to the dark web and uh, access anything you want is something that is just it's baffling for a lot of people. I know we, we talked earlier about sometimes children or sometimes uh, people just aren't, they're not necessarily seeking fentanyl, but sometimes it happens um, for a parent or for anyone. What are signs to look for for a potential fentanyl overdose? Yeah, so with uh, any opioid overdose, um, overdose takes place because we, our breathing slows down and it slows down to the point where it can no longer support life. Um, at, at the most extreme uh, end of the spectrum. Signs of overdose are unable to wake the person up. Um, they may have pinpoint pupils. They're just very, very tiny pupils. Um, they may be snoring, um, but you'll look for um, poor respiration, slow breathing, um, 
or spaced out, deep gasping breathing. Either way, these are signs of some sort of medical emergency. So you want to get on the phone with 911 or have somebody call 911 if you're with somebody else. Um, and then if naloxone is available, you want to administer that. A lot of the naloxone that's available is the Narcan branded um, nasal spray. So it's as easy as giving Afrin. It's just a mist that goes into the nose. Um, but the signs of a fentanyl overdose are, are not subtle. Um, so yes, utilize 911 um, if you're by yourself. Put your phone on speakerphone so you've got both hands to work. And then um, the call taker will, will talk you through what you need to do. Daniel, another thing I was, I was going to add and have you elaborate on. People always ask me when, they're, when we're training them, they're hesitant to administer the naloxone because they're just not sure. What if it's something else? I don't want to give them this Narcan and then have it not be the case. Am I going to hurt this person by giving them Narcan? And, that, and you're not going to hurt somebody by giving them the Narcan. So this is, if you, if you were to administer that Narcan um, and, and it turned out that they were um, having a different kind of medical emergency or they were overdosing on a different kind of substance, you're not going to hurt that person. So it's one of those um, shoot first, ask questions later kind of situations. Um, it, sitting there and, um, and overthinking it is, is not the course of action. So if someone was having the signs and symptoms that Daniel was describing, you know, it doesn't always have to be a complete absence of breathing, but a gurgling, or you know, you can you can note the color change and blue. You know, there's all kinds of different things that your body does when you're um, deficient in oxygen. Um, the Narcan is a tool that that you should access. But like he said, call 911 first. Get your get your friends with the with the ambulance on the way. Um, but uh, Narcan is an amazing tool. Daniel, would you like to talk too about sometimes it takes more than one dose um, because of the just the amount yeah uh, first you said uh, everything already yourself that was good <laughs> yeah I like to that do like a little visual aid with it but yes um, just just to reiterate what Brandy said Narcan is Narcan is the brand name for naloxone it's the same thing super safe medication. If you give that medication and you were wrong in your diagnosis, so let's say it is an alcohol overdose, just massive alcohol overdose, similar presentation. They're breathing bad, you can't wake them up. You give Narcan, it's gonna do nothing. It's just gonna attach to those receptors and do nothing. Um, so it's, it's, it's safer than acetaminophen or anything else we can get on the shelf at, at Walgreens or CVS. Um, luckily, with the branded uh, Narcan, that's a four milligram um, preparation. It's rare that we have to give multiple doses if we're waiting that two to four minutes. Um, a lot of times, though, in a medical emergency, time goes by slowly. And so two minutes feels like, you know, six to eight business years. So time is going slowly. Um, and so that, that's another reason to have the, the, the call taker, you know, help you through that. They're looking at a clock. They're looking at a timer. Um, they will tell you when it's been X number, number of minutes after you gave the Narcan. But if you get to that four minute mark and you, you don't see an improvement in the person's breathing, you can give the second dose. And almost all of these kits come with at least two doses. So you can give that second dose. We want you to give it to the other nostril to spread the surface area that the medication comes into contact with. Uh, if uh, maybe Daniel will talk about this even more, and remember that that Narcan and naloxone is the objective or the goal is to remove the opioid off of the receptor, but only for a period of time. So it's not like it's the automatic antidote and it's like they just go back to being what they are being prior to. And also the one thing when we were initially starting, Tony, the uh, Texas Overdose Naloxone Initiative, one of the things that we always talked about, the fact that individuals um, in, in a lot of cases, if it were accidental, 
they were combining a non or an opioid with a non-opioid sedative, such as alcohol, as Daniel had just mentioned. And I think that that's also something to take into consideration, um, just because of what happens inside the body. And we can get super scientific about it, but I think the 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 key phrase is contacting 911 and not being afraid to do so, and then uh, administering the naloxone. I love asking Daniel questions. So kids who kids who think, okay, I can do this. I'm going to take this pill because I have Narcan. What's the problem with that? Um, I mean, that's not a. It's not. A, it's not guaranteed a, a safe kind of situation. The, look. Any time that we go by where we're not getting enough oxygen can be uh, a potential for permanent damage. I mean, after three to four minutes, we start getting into the territory of damage becoming permanent, it's irreversible. Um, but we, we heard a lot of reports about Narcan parties and these sort of things. We found that that was mostly kind of sensationalized in the media. The thing about Narcan is that somebody who's dependent on opioids, whether it's pain medicine or fentanyl or, or illicit fentanyl, um, they don't want to be Narcan. That will take all of the opioids off their receptors and they will be very, very, very sick. They will be thrown into immediate withdrawals. Um, so a lot of people want to avoid having to get Narcan, um, but it's, it's not a safety. It's not a safety net. Um, it, it's not foolproof, you know? And Narcan is not the, it's not the answer to the opioid crisis, you know? It's not a treatment for opioid use disorder or addiction. You know, the same way that if you had heart disease, you went to your cardiologist and they just gave you an AED. They said, well, when you go into cardiac arrest, is hopefully somebody can shock you with this. No, they're gonna put you on a blood pressure medicine, maybe a low dose aspirin, uh, medicine to reduce your cholesterol. They're gonna prevent, hopefully, you from having to use that AED. Right, so Narcan, yeah, it's a, it's a Band-Aid situation. We want it to help keep, keep people alive, but we also need to do everything else that was talked about on the stage, right? Addressing underlying issues, um, you know, uh, getting people help for mental health issues, past trauma, uh, everything, everything else like that, and engaging people in evidence-based treatment for addiction. There's medications that can maintain somebody um, that are proven to reduce overdose risk by more than 70%. Um, so just getting people uh, access to all those things. I think one thing that's important to note too in, in, in these conversations that you guys are gonna start having with your kids, um, instill in them to never leave anyone without calling help. I know the normal human reaction sometimes when you're younger is like, oh no, I'm gonna get in trouble if I'm caught here with this person who was doing drugs because I was experimenting too. Whatever the case may be, you may have been an innocent passenger in the car and, and that person took a substance and they're now passed out and you panic and leave. Don't do that. You're not gonna get in trouble if you call 911 and get that person help. So. Um, you know, don't have that weighing on your mind that you left somebody behind and they ended up dying. That, that's never a good scenario. I know we're saying Narcan is, is not the end all be all, but if a parent wants to have it just in case, where can they buy it? Is this something that they can have access to? Is this something that they could go to CVS or Walgreens? I know you guys mentioned those stores. Is that something available there? Yes, there are standing orders. Um, written by physicians in Texas at all the big box pharmacies, you know, um, the ones we've listed, and then just any of the major one, major chains. Um, you, it's a standing order the same way that a flu shot is a standing order. So it's not over the counter, but it's already pre-signed by a physician. Um, you can go there. Many insurances have a no copay or low copay, um, and then the pharmacist will give you some on-the-spot training there's great resources online. But um, if somebody does not have medical insurance, there's a lot of um, other community organizations. Um, MoreNarcanPlease.com is, um, that's the kind of the, the hub 
uh, for, for the uh, state-funded Narcan that's distributed uh, in Texas. So if you're an individual and you just want to carry this, um, which you are allowed to do under Texas Senate Bill 1462, um, you can go to morenarcanplease.com, request a, a kit, and they will mail it to you. It takes a little bit of time to get that mailed to you. So if you are needing something more immediately, I would visit the uh, you know, pharmacy if you got medical coverage. At um, our table, um, we do have uh, some Narcan, Narcan uh, together uh, actually stapled with um, administration um, directions. I, I think that that's very important to understand um, not just how to use it, but, but some of the things to think about. Um, lastly, I don't know if you're going to ask this question, but I kinda, I'll just kind of proceed it. Um, if you see that it has an expiration date, don't get freaked out about it. Right, because you can continue to con to have that Narcan. I still have Narcan from, man, about six, about maybe four or five, maybe six years ago. Um, I usually keep it in my car um, uh, during the winter time, not during the summertime. Um, but I will keep it in the bag uh, just in case. I think it's again, it's just one of those things that's always good to have. And FDA just recently approved um, over-the-counter naloxone. Well, actually, it's Narcan. That's been the one that's been approved. It's not over the counter just yet, but it should be in the near future. Um, and one other thing about having Narcan and carrying Narcan, you may be saying, well, my kid doesn't do drugs and his friends don't do drugs. I don't need to have Narcan. You could be in the Walmart parking lot and find somebody who's passed out. And I'd rather have that Narcan and never need it than to need it and not have it. So it's good to just have one and carry it in, in your glove box or wherever you feel comfortable having it. But you just never know. So we have a, we have a few more questions before we, uh, or a few more submitted questions before we um, go ahead and close out the, the stage Q&A. But our question is, is um, what are we doing, I think this is more so for, for Chief Weiner, uh, what are we doing to make sure substances like these aren't making its way into campuses and, and what do we do if we find them? So at the district it's a team effort to make sure that this isn't happening. It's not just on the police. All of our staff is, um, is cognizant of the risk and um, they actually have uh, broader authorities for search than the police do. Uh, so um, they can do administrative searches if they believe that the students have uh, something that may uh, endanger the student body or staff. And so they've got the ability um, to uh, go through backpacks and things like that. Uh, so they're the first line of defense and then the police department is there uh, should something be found, we can test it. Um, we can also uh, be there if there are significant amounts that are recovered. So there's a way that we work together to make sure that um, we're mutually supportive of, of uh, administration and the police department. Thank you so much. And so we we're down to our last two questions. And the, the second last question is really, how do, how do I protect my kid from this? Open, honest conversations, I think that's the first step, right? Being willing to have an uncomfortable conversation. I think as parents, we like to, if we're gonna engage in a conversation, we're, we're gonna know what we're gonna say and how to respond, and we might not know in this situation. And I think being comfortable as parents is sometimes saying, I don't know, let's figure this out together. But I think for me, that's the biggest thing is just being willing to set in some uncomfortableness <laughs> that's even a word, um, with your students so they, they know you're willing to be in that space with them. I agree with that. And, um, you know, experimenting is nothing new. And the problem nowadays, when I was young and dumb, I learned from my mistakes. And these days, kids aren't, aren't waking up that next morning to learn from that mistake. You know, Cameron, Cameron didn't want to die. He didn't deserve to die from his mistake. And, and so to know the facts as a parent, to be able to have those conversations with your kids so they can, can know that that one mistake could end their life and change their family's lives forever is, is really crucial. So for you to be equipped with enough knowledge to know how to explain that landscape and come up with a plan um, for an exit plan when they're out in a, in a situation and might be compromised or kind of, um, you know, in a peer pressure situation, 
coach them through that. Coach them through how to how to get out of those situations in a, in a healthy way. So, one of my um, last uh, units that I worked in in the uh, Safe P facility for substance abuse felony punishment um, was the Henderson unit in Henderson, Texas. It's a huge 2,500 man unit, and um, when I would be in the pods talking to them about their substance use. Uh, one of the things, it, it was an ongoing joke, but it, I would say, look, man, your best thinking got you here. And it would make them scratch their heads for a second. And the reason why I bring that up is it goes back to your question. Is it that we protect them from this or we protect them from themselves? Again, whenever I'm feeling a certain way and I want to feel differently, at that moment, I'm not thinking about this panel. I'm not thinking about what mom said. I'm not thinking about sheriff. I'm not thinking about Daniel. I'm thinking about changing the way I feel. And as Dr. Grusso said, I think it's very important for individuals to develop an awareness, an awareness of self whenever they start to feel a particular way, and then also an awareness of the dangers that one pill can kill, and I don't like cliches, but, but I, I will use it in this instance because I think it's very, very fitting. Something you said made me think too of, we have to be okay for our kids to sit with unpleasant emotions. I think sometimes as parents, we think our job is to make sure our kids never struggle and are happy all the time, and that's not reality. Reality is there's ups, there's downs, and a lot of it's just right in the middle. Um, and so how do we help them learn that they can be in a down spot and that they can learn how to cope with that and sit with those hard emotions and they don't need an, an immediate exit out? And I think that's as parents realizing that it's okay for our kids to be in that space and that we don't need to fix it for them, but how do we sit with them in that and be okay with that? being able to help them talk talk to them about options and what those options look like right if if you aren't feeling right and you don't want to feel this way well what are this what are some of the solutions what are some of the options that you have I think um, just something to add is you know with kids who uh, don't open up a lot we got to listen to them we got to listen to when they're talking because uh, we do all the time, nonstop. Are you listening to me? Well, we need to reciprocate because if they feel dismissed, they're much less likely to re-engage. And we need to be providing them with accurate information, um, honest, accurate information, because if we don't do it, they're going to get it from another source, and that source might be way off, just total trash. So um, we need to not be afraid to bring these conversations up and give uh, honest, accurate information. So you guys actually got ahead. So my final question was, um, what's the one thing you hope that parents leave knowing tonight? I think you guys summed up a lot. Um, is, there, is there anything else that anyone would like to add? I just want to reassure our parents um, that, that uh, we as a school district, we are trying everything we can, and we will continue learning and growing and doing things. But I heard like some, some of the things we implemented this year, and um, we talked about the awareness campaign and things like that. So we are ourselves trying to kind of learn and adjust. But our, our main, main uh, priority is really to keep our students safe. Um, but we also, I want our parents to know that it, again, takes a village, and we all need to work together to ensure that our students are safe um, with us and also uh, everywhere they go, obviously, right? But um, I mean, because it's out there. We know it's out there. We know um, you heard, you know, the stories, right? So we, again, we don't wanna, uh, our job is to work together to ensure again that that doesn't happen uh, in any of our students here in, in, in Round Rock ISD. Stacy, I'm gonna use a cliche, but one thing I like to always end with is never say not my child. I'm here to tell you, don't say, not my child. 
So in first responders, when we have a storm coming in or, you know, bad weather or riots or, you know, we know we have warning that this is going to happen. We get together and we prepare and we plan. And that's what we're doing here, right? We're bringing a topic forward. We're preparing for the worst and celebrating that we're, we're not having to face the worst. And that's what I just want to say that um, knowing that fentanyl's out there, know, kn the more you know, the more you can plan, the more you can prepare, the more you can be ready. And that's exactly what I think that the school district is trying to do, what we in law enforcement are trying to do. We're, we're going to overcome this, but like the superintendent said, we're going to do it together. Oh, go ahead, uh, Steve. In, in, the, um, in this book they call the big book on page 37, they actually talk about this thing um, that a lot of people talk about, and they say the definition of insanity, and they say it's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And Bill Wilson said, ah, I beg to differ a little bit. And what he says is, why? And he said, at that moment, a person lacks a proportion of the ability to think straight. Therefore, they do the same thing over and over and over again. At that moment, at that moment, trust is the conduit of influence. And if I trust what I'm receiving from whomever, right, whether it's a friend, whether it's my parents, whether it's my dealer, at that moment I'm trusting that it's going to fix me. I want you just to sit with that for a moment. It's really uncomfortable to be uncomfortable. And no one wants to be broke. No one. Whether it's in your wallet or in your head or in your heart, no one wants to be broke. We all want to be whole in some capacity. I think it's really important to understand that a key motivating factor in a lot of these situations is the word trust. There has to be an amount of trust developed in some capacity. Thank you, Stacey. Um, the one thing that I uh, will tell uh, parents at, at some of these talks, or s students especially, is like, hey, if you leave here and you remember one thing, I want you to remember that um, unless you're getting a pill from a pharmacy, it is pressed, I promise you. And if it's a pill that's supposed to be a downer, i.e. if it looks like a pain pill, an Oxy, or if it looks like a Xanax or something else, I promise you it has, a, it has fentanyl in it. And it's an unmeasured amount of fentanyl. The thing that makes fentanyl dangerous in this context is that fentanyl is super potent. We measure it in micrograms. Um, it, it's a great medication, but it's, there's no room for error. Um, and again, this is an unmeasured amount. And then in, in terms of um, additional uh, illicit pills, I have a friend who's a researcher and a lot of these um, pressed Adderalls that are being sent off to the lab, they're all coming back positive for methamphetamine. So it gives that same similar result, right? Like if I am selling fake purses on the street, and I wanna sell brandy a, a fake purse, I just want it to look good enough like the real thing just so I can get the transaction and make that money. I don't care if it breaks the next day when she's on a plane, but it, like it, it's supply and demand, and we can't arrest our way out of this either. You know, we've got to approach this and, and, and engage folks with love and compassion and evidence-based treatment. You know, let our kids know, like, hey, man, you can talk to me. You know, it's gonna be weird at first, but like, we can open a, a line of communication. And let them know that they're loved. I tell my son all the time, I love you no matter what. Dad, you say that every day. I don't know. But like, no, I know. But I want, I want to sear it into your mind, you know, so that it's always there. That's 
I was just going to say that there's a lot of people on this stage, you know, this, this um, fentanyl crisis discussion that we're having tonight is just one thing that we deal with on a daily basis. The people on this back row back here, we work very hard all day, every day on a multitudes of problems that affect our kids. This is one very small problem. And I just want everyone, I just hope that everybody realizes how much we care and how much this affects us and that we would, we, you know, we, we really work together every day to try to help kids with this issue and lots of other ones. We're so thankful. I mean, Daniel and I keep kind of looking back and forth at each other because we, uh, we work together a lot. We're very, very blessed to have community partners like the people that are sitting in this front row. There are so many people in this area that work so hard that reach out to us to partner with us, to, to ask what we need, to, to do whatever it takes to get what we need to help our, keep our kids safe. Um, and I just hope that everybody realizes um, that there's a lot of people who care out there and that work really hard for the kids in our care. You know, I think as Daniel was talking, it came in my mind that this whole, everything we've talked about tonight, that there's no room for judgment and we're only gonna get there with empathy. And I think that goes in so many ways, but not judgmental against people who struggle with mental health or addiction. We like to judge both of those so readily and that that doesn't help us get anywhere. So it's only through empathy for others, for our kids, for ourselves, um, for all of those individuals that do this work every day that we're gonna be able to move forward. And I think I just wanna point out that um, like was said earlier, this is a team effort. None of us up here have the answer for everything that's going wrong, um, but we're just hoping that together we can figure it out and do what's right for the students and be there for the parents uh, if they need us. So thank you all. As you said, we may not have the answer now, but we're working hard together to make it happen. Um, so with that said, that's our final question for the night. And I want to thank our panelists again for sharing their time, their knowledge, their expertise with us to help educate our community and, and give our parents the knowledge they need to support their students. Um, for those in attendance and for those watching li the live stream, if you guys want to watch this again, this, a recording of this will be available on our district's fentanyl awareness website. It'll also be posted on our homepage and social media channels. And this is a conversation that's going to continue. And if you have questions after today, please reach out to us on Let's Talk. And it's available on roundrockisd.org. We're here to answer your questions. We're here to connect you with the right people. And we're here to support you in any way that we can. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close our Q&A um, portion. And I invite our attendees and our panelists to join us in the lobby so we can continue this important conversation one-on-one. -on -one. All right, thank you all. <laughs>